Monica, you can start. Okay. Good evening, respected dignitaries. I am Dr. Monica Jain, senior resident at Indira Gandhi Government Medical College, Nagpur, and your today's master of ceremony. Today, we are presenting a case on PG Star Series 11, Ovarian Mass, a Dilemma, an initiative started by Nagpur Obstetrics Gynecological Society in association with IGGMC Nagpur. Benign ethnic lesions are in are in estimated 30% of the diagnostic load of our clinical practices, as we all must have diagnosed it and treated it at least once in our clinical practice. What makes this entity a tricky business is the various differential diagnosis and its vast classification and differentiating features. I hereby welcome Dr. Sushma Deshmukh, ma'am, President of Nagpur Obstetrics Gynecological Society. Ma'am is an enthusiast, a scholar, and an all-rounder. She has an experience of over 33 years in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. Ma'am is a compassionate listener and a great counselor. Being a recent pass out, I can heartily thank Ma'am for starting such a mind-expanding learning experience. I invite Ma'am to address us further. Thank you, Dr. Monica. First of all, a very good evening to all. Respected seniors, friends, my budding all PG friends, and respected Bappa. Yes, our Bappa has arrived. It gives me festival like but studious feeling to welcome you all for today's 11th webinar of our PG Star Series by Nagpur Obhijaya Society in association with Indira Gandhi Government Medical College, Nagpur. Thanks to Dr. Alka Patankar, ma'am. We know that Lord Ganesha is a god of wisdom. And today, we, we, and today we need it specially when we discuss dilemmas, like conditions like ovarian masses. And today is, you know, date is 21st, which is very important for Ganpati as we offer 21 Durvas, 21 Modaks. So I think we'll be able to solve all dilemmas with all wisdom faculties. Because we know many times, ovarian mass is a silent intruder. No symptoms, no signs, no pain. It can be an accidental detection and we have to use our clinical acumen. So Dr. Gaurang Narayan, blessed with Lord Ganesha, will present the case on approach to benign adnexal mass. Dr. Spruti Agrawal from Dakno, Dr. Ashish Jararia from Nagpur, are geared up with tons of knowledge to help Gauran because they know something wrong, something odd, making everyone confused. So these two will guide Dr. Gauran. Welcome Dr. Smriti Agrawal, Dr. Ashish Jarari and Dr. Gauran. But these adnexal masses may not be diagnosed as what type of category they are. But we know someone somewhere, a master of masters, is well equipped with all weapons of Sri Ganesha to conquer the evils, so diagnose them categorically with one brilliant weapon that is sonography. And the wisdom faculty is none other than Dr. Sonal Panchar from Ahmedabad. Welcome Dr. Sonal. Dr. Alka Patankar from Nagpur and Dr. Jyoti Dawale from Bangalore will share their wisdom remarks. You must have noticed that all wisdom faculties from South, North, East gathered on this auspicious occasion. Welcome Dr. Alka, Dr. Jyoti Rawai. MOC is Dr. Monica. See, Monica is really holding the reins of all these brilliant faculties and also welcome the audience, respected seniors and friends. Our Wisdom Academy, Dr. Anuja Bhalirao, Dr. Bhakti Gurza, Dr. Prachi Dikshit are constantly on their toes to come up with the different, different ideas and wonderful faculties. So let's enjoy this video activity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your address. So let us start our case presentation. I would like to invite our examiners, Dr. Smriti Agrawal, ma'am. Ma'am is a professor and head of department at Dr. RM LMIS Lucknow. It is our honor to be in presence of ma'am, who is an award holder of Professor Dhavendra Kumar Young Investigator Gold Medal by KGMU Lucknow. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Ashi Zararia, sir, Sir is an associate professor in obstetrics and gynecological department 
Sir is again an award holder of MS Signatory 2022. I guess a junior resident, Dr. Gaurang Narayan, second year, has to be thorough for his presentation today. I'd like to invite Dr. Gaurang. Let's start with the case presentation. Good evening to one and all. Uh... I'd like to begin by introducing myself. I'm Dr. Gaurang Narayan, second year junior resident, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Indira Gandhi Government Medical College, Nagpur. So the index case, Mrs. XZJ, 45 years, uh, residing at Pilanadi Nagpur, uh, who hails from a poor socioeconomic status, presented to the OPD with chief complaints of abdominal pain for 15 days and bloating sensation for one week. Uh, her abdominal pain is gradual in onset, was intermittent, vague, more towards the right side of the flank, and it was relieved with medications and rest. She gives no history of abnormal bleeding, irregular menstruation, abnormal discharge per vagina, or mass coming out of vagina. There is no history of altered bowel or bladder habits. There's no history of prolonged fever, cough, and any contact with known cases of tuberculosis. She's married since 30 years. She attained her menarc at 13 years of age. She is very Dr. Yes, so, Dr. Sushma, I wanted to ask you to, to be, does he finish the case and then we go back on certain things which we... No, no you, you can no, interrupt in between. Oh. No, like an examiner. You can yeah. interrupt and you can ask. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so can we go back on the previous slide? Yeah. So, uh, the next one, sorry, the third slide which you were showing. Yeah. So uh, we you, you were talking about an abdominal pain history, which is a very short duration, right? And um, the rest of the things which you asked was abnormal bleeding, irregular menstruation, etc. But there are a lot of other things which we would want to ask if a patient comes with just abdominal pain, you know. And I think we need to also elaborate on that. Can you just, you know, elaborate a little more? Any patient, you forget that she's on a textile mask. You forget that she's anything. She's just come with abdominal pain, right? Uh, Ma'am, negative histories for abdominal pain or uh, histories that we should elicit is, is there any associated gastric symptoms? Does yeah. she have any history of fever? Does she have any history of gastroenteritis? Uh, we should also include uh, medical history. Like, is there, uh, you know, history of uh, bleeding tendencies, uh, upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed, melina, constipation, obstipation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, any history of associated urinary complaints, flank pain, loin yeah. pain. Does she have prolonged fever, burning yeah, menstruation, yeah. dysuria? Um, these are the other symptoms which I would like to yeah. elicit. So exactly. So when we begin, we begin with a larger view and then we narrow down slowly, slowly as we take the history, right? Yes. yes so yes, what you said is very right. We have to look at gastroenteritis, nausea, vomiting and constipation, you know, because she's having abdominal pain. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Menstrual history, she's married since 30 years. She attained her menarc at 13 years of age. She's perimenopausal with last menstrual period attained at April 2023. She does not exactly remember her date. The previous cycle was in March 2023. Uh, she is a para-4, live-4 with uh, all previous facilitated normal vaginal deliveries with her last childbirth 22 years back. She has undergone PNC tubal ligation by mini lab after her last child. Her past menstrual histories have all been regular with an average flow, painless with associated of moderate soakage of pads. She does not give any history of abnormal uterine bleeding, passage of clots, mass, or intermenstrual bleed. She is a known case of systemic hypertension. She is on tablet amlodipine plus atenolol, uh, 5 plus 50 OD basis. She is compliant to her medications. There's no history of diabetes tuberculosis, bronchial asthma, COPD, sickle cell disorder, seizures or thyroid. She does not give any history of previous major surgeries or blood transfusion and she does not have a history of any known documented allergies to any medications. There is no history of gynecological breast or GM malignancies in the family. Uh, after due consent, verbal consent, after making the patient comfortable, explaining her the procedure and emptying her bladder, patient was examined. 
patient is conscious, cooperative, well-oriented to time, place, and person. She's adequately nourished. Her BMI is 31.179 kg per meter square. She falls under grade 2 obesity as per Southeast Asian classification. No elicited pallor, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, specifically supraclavicular lymphadenopathy, edema feet. Thyroid examination was within normal limits. There was no signs of thyroid abnormality. Breast examination was normal. There were no evidence of lump, swelling, skin dimples, nipple sores, or retraction. Cardiovascular system examination was normal with S1, S2 hurt with no murmurs. And respiratory system examination was clear. There was normal vesicular breath sounds with bilateral air entry. These are her vitals. Blood pressure 1170, pulse rate 78, respiratory rate 16 per minute, SpO2 98 under room hair, afebrile, and capillary refill time less than 3 seconds at the time of my examination. Abdominal examination on inspection, her abdomen is symmetrically distended. She was obese. Umbilicus was inverted. No flankfulness was noted. There was no evidence of situs. Tubal ligation scar was seen. It was an infra-umbilical transverse scar. There was no engorged veins or sinuses. Uh, herneal orifices were free. Cough impulse test was negative. Um, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're on mute. Are you able to comment on ascites on inspection? I wanted to know. Uh, ma'am, uh, minimal fluid collection will not be appreciated on inspection, but if it's a gross ascites... So you can uh, only say whether there is distension or not. You can't comment on ascites, right? Yes, ma'am. There was, and, no evidence, there was no evidence of gross distension. Yeah. So, and when you say abdomen is symmetrically distended, um, the, the right word is actually uniformly distended. Um, plus, we should also talk about whether the quadrants of the abdomen are moving well with respiration at the same time. All the four, all the quadrants of the abdomen, nine quadrants are moving well with respiration. Now. Right. On palpation. A uh, lower abdominal mass of around 20 to 22 weeks size uh, of 20 to 22 weeks corresponding to uterine size was noted. Uh, it was tensely cystic with smooth margins. Ma the mass was freely mobile and the lower margins of the mass uh, was able to reach the lower margins of the mass. There was no evidence of free fluid on examination. Shifting dullness test was negative. Bowel sounds were heard on all quadrants. There was no audible brewing. Uh, per vaginal examination, inspection of vulva and perineum was within normal limits. Per speculum examination, cervix and vagina was healthy. And pap smear was taken at the time of my examination. By manual examination, uterus, Amar, size, was, Bilya. uterus size was bulky. A uterus was retroverted. Lower pole of the mass was felt through the right fornix and the anterior fornix. It was cystic in consistency, smooth margins of around 20 to 22 week size. Um, it was, uh, as all the dimensions were able, I was able to make out, it was around 12 into 10 into 12 centimeter. Uh, the cervical movements were not transmitted to the mass. Uterus was felt separately from the mass and I was able to appreciate a cleft between the uterus and the mass. On per rectal examination, the rectal mucosa was free. There was no evidence of collection within the pouch of Douglas and I was able to confirm my pervisional findings on PR examination. So this is my probable diagnosis on history taking and examination that she's a 45 year old perimenopausal multiparous woman with lower abdominal pelvic mass, probably of ovarian origin with possibly benign nature. The possible differentials that I would like to enlist, uh, gynecological, a benign wait, wait, ovarian. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so you say that she's a 45 year old perimenopausal multiparous woman. Uh, of ovarian origin with possibly benign nature. So please let us know and everybody who is watching this that why do you think that she it is a mass of ovarian origin and why do you think it is possibly benign in nature before we go to differential diagnosis? Um, Ma'am, uh, the mass was adnexal in origin. The mass was adnexal in origin. Uh, she is a perimenopausal lady who is 45 year old. Considering the age, uh, uh, you know, benign masses are generally uh, seen in perimenopausal age group, while malignant masses or other masses are common in bimodal distribution of age. At age, it was the presenting symptoms were abdominal pain, and uh, uh, it was a vague type of abdominal pain. And on history, I was not able to elicit any uh, inheritance or family inheritance of any known gynecological GI or or um, breast malignancies. 
her uh, per abdominal examination the mass was freely mobile it was 220 to 22 week size the mass was freely mobile it was cystic in consistency there was no evidence of ascites uh, uh, and on per rectal per vaginal examination uh, the mass was of ovarian origin i was able to separate uh, identify with cervical motions were not transmitted cervix uh, to the mass so it was not of uterine origin and a cleft was clearly appreciated between the uterus and the uh, cervix and the uterus size on bimanual examination was bulky so considering all of these points i feel it is probably an adnexal mass of ovarian origin with possibly benign nature yes go ahead with the differential diagnosis um these are my probable differentials benign ovarian lesion malignant ovarian lesion functional ovarian cyst like to be specific when we talk of see when we talk of differentials no dr gorov so uh, we don't list the entire the, all the differentials which are given in our textbooks right for example when you have a case like this uh, is there any need to offer differentials is there any confusion in your mind i i have a conclusion in my mind uh, almost You Except have you have a confusion in your mind. Conclusion. Uh, yes. So you don't have any confusion, right? No confusion at all. But I have a confusion. You know, you you can you can be a little sure about your diagnosis, but you can't be hundred percent sure because this is not a clinical diagnosis, right? So then you can say probably that most probably this is a case of as you said an ovarian origin, possibly benign nature. but i would also like to rule out malignancy right so then you can if i ask you why do you think it is malignant you have some you should have something to support it right you can't just think ki nahi nahi mujhe lagta hai ki because textbook mein likha hai malignancy ho sakta hai to isliye mujhe rule out karna hai aapko kyu lag raha hai ki malignant ho sakta hai um ma'am first and foremost her symptoms have been very acute yes exactly this is a very uh, short history Short history, fifteen day duration, uh, associated with floating sensation. Um, second uh, is uh, she is almost reaching the perimenopausal age group. Yes. Though benign malignancies are common, but possibility of malignancy uh, has to be ruled out in perimenopausal age group. Um, third, um, uh, such a um. Uh, apart from certain specific varieties of benign ovarian lesion most of them are not such a large they are not large in size as large in size as uh, i was able to feel on examination so keeping these three factors in mind i would like to rule out the possibility of malignancy yes i totally agree with you uh, so why do you think that if you are uh, you think that this is most probably benign why do you think that she has such a short history um uh, ma'am uh, such a short history could have been uh, though this could have been present for over a long time there could have been an inflicting factor which would have triggered an acute history there could have been complications she could have had torsion she could have had rupture of the cyst or she could have had spillage hemorrhage into the cyst um uh, uh, sometimes rarely they could be inflicting causes uh, for example uh, certain ovarian lesions uh, after a trauma or after a coital act uh, these are possibilities that could have triggered uh, uh, abdominal pain in her and she could have presented with an acute history so if you think that she had any of these complications do you think that does she have any clinical signs to support these complications at present no no she so does maybe... not have uh, she say sorry ma'am so maybe the mass was largely asymptomatic and it is only because now it has grown in size that now she is developing symptoms symptoms and as you said there could be probably some some slight torsion you know cysts can always have a torsion and then they can again have a detorsion and they may be, they may again remain you know without much complaints yes i totally agree i think dr ashish has also joined us now yeah uh... Sorry, ma'am. I was in travel, and uh, am I audible? Yes, of course. Yes. yes. So, uh, very nicely presented. I, uh, I, I must appreciate. Uh, you have covered all the good points in history as well as in examination. 
just two three points which i like to stress on is uh, nowhere you mention about the tenderness and the pain because uh, you uh, patient had come to you with pain but there is no mention of tenderness in your slide so that one point you should have mentioned and uh, uh, another thing is uh, uh, what you are you are presenting a case of a cyst uh, and what we see in practice that these are actually accidental diagnosis very rarely they comes to you with pain so asymptomatic benign cysts are usually they come with an usg report and wo usg mein diagnose hone ke baad unko pain shuru hota hai most of the time that is the history so uh, anyways it was uh, very uh, nicely presented you have covered all the points and i think we can uh, go ahead with uh, further discussion on um, the diagnosis part and the treatment part uh, one more point i forgot to tell you that when you are talking about percussion and you were saying that i you there was no evidence of any free fluid and no shifting dullness at the same time you should also percuss on the mass yes ma'am so, um, uh, on the mass i was not able to um, uh, elicit any specific resonance generally certain benign masses uh, it because was a of dull it was dull a dull illness so one differential diagnosis you said it could be malignant do you also want to entertain any other differential diagnosis yes ma'am um uh, very very uh, rarely if we consider a large endometrioma a large endometrioma is possible edema cyst or uh, edema of the ovary is possible a uh, massive edema ovary because of uh, torsion uh, miss massive edema ovary could be possible um it could be a paratubular cyst it could be mesenteric cyst uh, these are my possible differential diagnoses in my mind okay so i think you can totally strike off the mucosal and the ancestral ascites and the pelvic kidney right yes and also the to abscess because the clinical history does not support it there is no history of fever tb contact mass is not restrictedly mobile though it's high up so tubo ovarian is of the list how do you clinically uh, rule out it's a case of mesenteric cyst or an ovarian cyst um uh, Ma'am, both of them are uh, high up lesions. Uh, they are present above, uh, but mesenteric cyst, uh, since it's a proper cyst, uh, a, a lower portion or it will not be uh, pedicle. A pedicle will not be felt, so you will not be able to. Though the all margins will be felt, a lower border will not be reached down the leg. Sir, second, since it's a cyst, it will generally associated with addition, so it will not be completely freely mobile. uh but uh, more so just on uh, cl uh, clinical examination it is dif uh, difficult to differentiate between an ovarian lesion and a mesenteric cyst uh, an ultrasound examination is necessary to rule out diagnosis i don't agree with i think what you are saying uh, does anybody else want to pitch in i think you can clinically kind of make out if it is a mesenteric cyst or an ovarian mesenteric cyst number one is quite high up as compared to ovarian mesenteric cyst so the mobility of the mesenteric cyst is completely directly perpendicular it's perpendicular to its attachment so we know that so if a cyst is mobile in a perpendicular direction only right perpendicular to the mesenteric attachment then you can say it could be a mesenteric cyst right so here you are able to feel the lower pole of the cyst but most of the adnexal masses you cannot feel the lower pole because the cyst gets impacted in the pelvis but mesenteric cysts are usually high up so it can be because it is a large ovarian cyst so that is why it is probably you know you are able to feel the lower pole of the cyst but mesenteric cysts have a very characteristic mobility pattern which is not seen in ovarians right Yes, ma'am. Right. So, Gorang, what uh, what are the further investigation like to do and uh, go ahead with this case? Um, so, to begin with, routine investigations: a complete blood count, a panel, uh, a elliptic KFT. Uh, I would like to then subject her uh, a BSL fasting post meal, and then I like to subject her to uh, an ultrasound examination, a transabdominal ultrasound. Uh, so you will do a transvaginal sonography first, and then all these investigations just to have an pre-anesthetic checkup part. Ah, uh, sir, transabdominal ultrasound first. Transabdominal ultrasound first. Ah, uh, these are 
since she is also hypertensive and uh, she's come with acute abdominal pain uh, to look for any source of infection or leukocytosis associated with torsion, I'd like to do a CBC. The other evaluations are just a part of pre anesthetic checkup. Transabdominal ultrasound is my first investigation of choice in this case. Okay, so as soon as you take a history, you make an examination and you think there is some, there's a cyst, then you straightforward go with transabdominal plus TVS, both the things should be done together and then followed by blood investigation and other routine investigation for anesthetic checkup point. Right. Okay. So what, what are the things you will, uh, you are expecting to see in transvaginal sonography? Um, so, um, ultrasound will be able to, uh, differentiate between a uh, benign and malignant, uh, uh, lesion. It will be able to comment properly on the ovarian origin, but since this is a high up mass, um, uh, a, a trans abdominal ultrasound probably will give a better picture than a trans vaginal sonography in this particular case. Uh, depending on the, the localarity, depending on the septum, depending on the um, uh, presence or absence of fluid, we will be able to narrow down on the diagnosis, uh, narrow down to the possible etiology or benign or malignant uh, ovarian lesion. So can you elaborate on the ultrasound findings which suggest you that this is a benign cyst and not a malignant one? So generally benign cysts are unilocular while uh, uh, malignant ones are uh, multilocular. Uh, malignancy is generally associated with bilaterality as well. Uh, thin septae are seen in benign lesions while thick septae more than 3 millimeter is appreciated in uh, malignant lesions. Uh, presence or absence of ascites can be seen. Uh, generally, they uh, uh, associated presence of solid areas, presence of papillary projections are uh, commonly noted in malignant uh, ovarian lesions. Uh, right. These days, even Doppler studies are used uh, to differentiate between benign and malignant. So, a low resistance index less than four, pulsatility index less than one is also a feature of. Uh, uh, malignancy because they are highly vascular. Malignant tissues will be more vascular than benign lesions. Right, perfect. So, uh, do you know imaging scores? There are many uh, IOTA and ORAT scores. So, are you aware of these scores? Uh, yes, sir. Um, IOTA classification uh, is International Ovarian Tumor Analysis Classification, which gives uh, five point score, five uh, classification, five point scoring to differentiate between benign and malignant lesions. Um, and uh, ORAD uh, gives a grading system. They are ovarian adnexal uh, uh, research development study analysis group, which gives uh, a classification system uh, on ovarian lesions, ORAD 1. So are you interested in visualizing the uterus also? And uh, what is your interest in uh, visualizing the uterus? Um, sir, uh, it, I am interested in visualizing the uterus as well. Uh, adnexal, uh, certain ovarian lesions uh, uh, can also have, uh, a uter uh, you know, uh, uh, inflicting the effect on the uterus. So it is important to look at the uterus as well. Hyperestrogenic conditions can also be appreciated, uh, you know, looking at the uterus. We should associatedly look for uh, changes of adenomyosis, endometriosis in the uterus. These are the associated things that I'd like to look in the uterus as well. So yes, polyps, uh, lining, endometrial thickness, and uh, fibroids. You'd like to definitely rule out. And one yes. more thing in TVS, which uh, you should not uh, forget, is also have a look at the other ovary. See, if you think that this is one-sided, you also want to see, and in transabdominal scan, you can't see the other ovary, right? Because of the large amino mass. So you should say TAS plus TVS. And if anybody asks you why TVS, say I want to look at the endometrium, the uterus, and the other ovary. Any other important organ you want to see as a gynecologist? So fallopian other tube. than what we discussed right now? Breast. Kidneys. Uh, you must see on the right side of kidney as it's a huge mass. Whether there is any back pressure changes, hydronephrosis, compression. So, as a gynecologist, you must have a habit of looking at the kidneys also. Yes, sir. 
Right. So you had a. Uh, do you have a further case, or, or you have? Uh, have you got the ultrasound pictures of this patient? Um, no, sir. Uh, I was not able to retrieve the ultrasound images, but okay. ultrasound examination was done. Uh, they had given a complex, uh, probably hemorrhagic ovarian cyst of around twelve point five to twelve point nine into twelve point five centimeter, and uh, the endometrial thickness was normal. It was around six millimeters. Uh, and uh, they had given it as ORAGE 3 lesion. They had suggested further evaluation uh, of CA-125 and MRI to reaffirm the diagnosis. Right. So that is what uh, I, I was coming to. Uh, uh, what are the indications of doing CT MRI in such case? Um, uh, sir, uh, generally... Why uh, CT and why MRI? Can you just uh, tell a few points about advantages of doing CT in a adnex cell mass and advantages of doing MRI in an adnex cell mass? Um, sir, uh, with uh, regards to uh, generally, if it's a complex adnex cell mass, uh, if it's a simple adnex cell mass, it does not indicate uh, a CT or an MRI evaluation. But right. adnex cell, complex adnex cell masses uh, warrant a CT or MRI evaluation. MRA is better because uh, uh, MRA will be able to delineate. Generally, MRA is the investigation of choice in ovarian lesions as it will be able to delineate uh, the origin, the type, and uh, will be able to comment on the possibility of malignancy. But uh, considering MRA is a costly evaluation in comparison to CT, uh, CT can, in a low set, resource setting area, CT can even be considered as an initial uh, higher up evaluation of choice rather than MRA. Uh, but see, uh, further, uh, CT, uh, we'll also be able to comment on the, uh, uh, so this, since it's an ovarian lesion, it could probably be because of primary ovarian origin or it could be a secondary ovarian seed link with primary elsewhere. So MRA has a very restricted region. of. Uh, what value. are the clinical features for you to suggest that this could be a primary ovarian or a secondary ovarian? Uh, Ma'am, uh, this is probably a primary ovarian region because uh, commonly breast malignancies, GI malignancies uh, have uh, secondaries in the ovary. Uh, but patient does not have any GI or uh, complaints of breast. My examination of breast was also normal. But she does not give any... ovarian clinically also, you can, Dr. Gorang, uh, make out if it is a primary or a secondary. So first we will come to that. Then we will go on to where the primary can be. Uh, clinically, a uh, patient is uh, is not having signs of cachexia. There is no supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. She does not have signs of venous obstruction. Uh, patient uh, mass per se is again freely mobile. There is not. There is no bilaterality. There is no yeah. bilaterality. So usually, uh, the masses which are Huckenberg type, which are secondary ovarian, they're usually bilateral, and they're not usually tensely cystic. Right. And they usually do not attain such huge sizes. So that's why yes, you can yeah, you can say that it is possibly primary only. So CT scan is better to uh, to comment on whether it's a primary origin or a secondary origin. So these are my points. Okay. So yes, you correctly said that uh, CT and MRI has uh, uh, as a definite values uh, in complex evaluation of a complex mass. Perfect. Now, um, suppose you have now come up with a diagnosis of a benign mass on CT, MRI and uh, your ultrasound. And uh, how, how will you go ahead? It's a benign uh, 10 by 12 centimeter mass. Uh, sir, since it's such would a you large... Would like to investigate her or uh, would you straightforward go with the management? Um, so since this is a very large mass, um, uh, we can investigate her for ruling out malignancies, which we have done. We can also probably do a CA-125 further to see. And then the best option would be to explore and to see why, what is the reason for such a big mass. So it is better to take the patient for exploratory laparotomy. What is CA-125 and uh, why you want to do it in this case? Um, Sir, the patient is uh, perimenopausal. Uh, 
complete possibility of uh, uh, malignancy to rule out CA125 can be done, but per se CA125 is not uh, for uh, establishing a diagnosis of malignancy because CA125 can be falsely positive even in other conditions uh, uh, like uh, endometrioma, fibroid, or adenomyosis. But a CA125, so CA125 is not a very uh, is not a good uh, is really not not going to be very helpful in this case per se. It may be helpful in some other scenarios. Uh, any other uh, tumor markers you'd like to do? How these uh, germ cell uh, tumor presents to you? Sir, uh, uh, tumor marker uh, of germ cell uh, tum uh, tum tumor marker for germ cell tumors uh, uh, is uh, alpha fetoprotein placental lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, uh, alpha. So how do they uh, present? How do they present? Ma'am, germ cell tumors are generally present. Age of presentation is generally in the uh, young adolescent uh, age group women. They will generally be right. bilateral. Uh, there is an acute presentation. Uh, patient uh, will have associated features of, uh, you know, um, uh, malignancies. Like there will be loss of uh, sleep wake cycle, altered bowel bladder habits. Patient will have that cachexic feature. Uh, and uh, it will be a fix mass, not freely mobile. Uh, so these are the presenting yes, in terms features. of tumors, especially the uh, the endodermal sinus tumors. Number one, they're very rapidly growing masses. Number two, they usually have a short history, like this lady, right? And most of the times they're unilateral, the endodermal sinus tumor. So if you can actually say that, you know, that because it is a very rapidly, it's a large tumor and she has a short history, and it is unilateral, it is quite possible that this could be. And these are all pathological diagnoses, right? So you can't be sure. So you, you will be justified in saying that I want to do these tumor markers to be sure before I am managing this case or operating this case. You'll be completely justified, right? So I think maybe uh, though there are more chances that at this age, the tumors are more epithelial in origin, but you will be justified to say if you want to even rule out the germ cell malignancies that you want to do those tumor markers as well. Right, Dr. Ashish? Yes, tumor, yes. So, so uh, you... tumor markers are done, then how do you proceed now? Suppose if uh, you're all negative. Ma'am, uh, it, it, um, such a big mass, within, especially when the patient is complaining uh, of uh, pressure symptoms like abdominal pain, it is better to explore her. So I would uh, be anesthetic after evaluation. I would fit the patient for surgery and take her up for exploratory laparotomy. Why not go for a laparoscopic cystic, Tommy? Um, sir, uh, this is tensely cystic uh, mass. Uh, the patient uh, is having a broad mass. It's a large mass in size. It is cystic. There is uh, fluid in the mass. So laparoscopic surgery uh, would be difficult. Uh, uh, it, it should, so it is better to go for a laparotomy. There's a possibility of spillage in laparoscopic surgery more than laparotomy. What is the parabdominal finding? I mean, actually, I missed it, so I'm asking you. Sir, she had an abdominal okay. pelvic mass so corresponding to uterus size 20 to 22 V. The mass was freely mobile. Uh, lower so of the still, mass. Was... I, I think up to that size, you can always go for a laparoscopic cystectomy. Yes. But the so people. Maybe, yeah. So, Dr. Goran, maybe you can, you know, put it up this way that, yes, both the approaches can be done. It depends upon the expertise available. Yeah, as Dr. Ashish is saying, this is a 22-week size mass. So, you can place the trocar a little high up, you know, and then you can actually remove it because you are, like, you kind of looking at the uh, uh, the clinical findings and everything, you ki you're kind of sure that this is possibly a benign mass where an hemorrhage has happened. And probably that is why she had pain abdomen. You know, that 15 days history. That could have been because of the hemorrhage in the cyst. So you're still justified to say that I want to do it laparoscopically. It depends upon the expertise available. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to do a hysterectomy for this patient? As you're opening the abdomen for a 45-year-old female. Hmm. Um, no, sir. Uh, if I am keeping germ cell uh, tumor as, as a differential diagnosis, uh, and if my intraoperatively uh, uh, I am uh, not convinced, then I can go for a frozen section, and then if signs of malignancy are seen, 
I would like to do a, a THBSO along with it. But uh, for a benign lesion per se, I would not like to uh, take her up for a hysterectomy. I would like to do a simple hysterectomy and come back. And plus or minus ophorectomy, depending on the viability of the old, such a large cyst, you will not be able to do cystectomy. I think you will have to do uh, ophorectomy with salpingectomy. Yeah, salpingectomy, but not hysterectomy. That to a bilateral salpingectomy. Yes. Why specific mention of salpingectomy? Uh, sir, uh, removal of uh, fallopian tube uh, can also be a source of uh, malignancy. Uh, and uh, fallopian tube per se can be uh, keeping tubes there can be, yes, can be a source. So always better to remove the tubes. Yes, sir. Perfect. Great. I think Dr. Gordon, you're doing well. You're doing well. Uh, now also tell us um, probably just in the end that uh, when you are opening up, what are the um, suspicious findings in the exploration which you can find, which can, you know, make you again think that this could be malignancy? And what should you do then? Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, uh, on opening up, if I'm able to find gross ascites, if I'm able to find uh, malignant seedlings, there could be adhesions, malignant seedlings, um, uh, the ma mass, the surface of the mass, the structure of the mass, uh, consistency of the mass. Uh, if I am suspicious that it is malignancy, then uh, I must take all due precautions to prevent the spillage seedling that I'm trying to do. Uh, second, I would... Uh, not close it up. I would like to give if facilities are available. I'd like to do frozen section to reaffirm my diagnosis. Though I just don't remove the mask, I completely do a TH BSO with a plus or minus partial omentectomy along. And if you don't find anything suspicious, then also you should take peritoneal biopsies. Doing it laparoscopically again, look at the entire peritoneal cavity. If there are any kind of deposits, additions, nodules present, right? you should not miss that. Great. I think you're all set to take up your exams whenever they happen. Yes. Going nicely done. And uh, it's a, uh, it was a really great discussion. Yeah, Gaurang did very well. And the examiners are also very nice. <laughs> it's a very, very good discussion. I think the students were good. The students can make the discussions happen and go smoothly, no? Dr. Bhakti student. <laughs> I'm 10 minutes to go. We can continue the discussion for another 10 minutes. We will be starting the lecture at 8. Okay. okay so, ma Sonal Madam is there. Na? Welcome, Sonal Madam. She's there. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. I was listening to the entire discussion. Mm -hmm. If I'm allowed to, I have a few, uh, I don't know, I have a few queries. And uh, the main thing is that I thought this was a discussion on benign ovarian masses and the entire discussion was like on malignancies. So why are we always thinking that masses in the menopausal, perimenopausal women are always malignant? That's one issue. Second issue is that ultrasound is a very potential modality um uh, and especially dopplers even the even the the morphological studies on 2ds and the 3ds and why have we not discussed anything about that and directly shifted to just the ct and the mr because it is ultrasound which can be a dynamic examination which can give you much more information uh, than what uh, probably was uh, discussed or what is thought of so that's another query that is in my mind. The third thing is that um, what do we mean when we say complex mass? Because this is a very loosely used and, a, and, and a, uh, probably a very, um, I would say, non-specific term. Because when we say complex, do we mean it is solid and cystic? Do we mean it is hemorrhagic? Do we just mean to say there are internal ecogenicities 
And this makes a huge difference in the diagnosis. So that's that's the third thing that I would like to point out and probably major, uh, uh, I, I, and yes, one more thing is that, yes, this is actually a very huge mass which is being talked about. So it's less likely to be uh, related to um, any any physiology or, or menstrual cycle, but um, when, uh, no, not all masses are this big, and still they are when they're reported as complex masses, the immediate immediate thought process goes towards malignancy. So um, why can we not think of physiologically uh, uh, grown masses like there can be a big hemorrhage exist, which is really just just a huge residual corpus luteum. Of course, not this huge. I'm not talking of this size. This is truly a very big size. But yes, five, six centimeters often can be a, a corpus luteum, can be a residual non-active corpus luteum, which we actually call it a hemorrhagic. So there can be so many things probably which should be thought of before uh, um, putting a diagnosis or even telling the patient that it's likely that you may have a malignancy because it can have a huge psychological impact on the patient. These are queries. It's just a thought process that is initiated. I'm not as, telling you. Yeah, I'm just saying, as everybody is knowing, you are there to cover it. <laughs> no, no, ma'am. No, that is not. Just I'm joking. This is what, no, no, no. I really told this because I really felt that it, it was some of my family yeah, members. Well, actually, so doctor is necessary. Yeah. I would definitely feel that why right away we are talking only about no, my um, Ma'am, but we did talk about um, the ultrasound features. We did talk about the Doppler, so not in detail. Yeah, it was yeah. quite inefficient because it's not just, say, if we say just the resistance index. No, that's not the criteria because you need to observe the vascular pattern. You need to observe the branching pattern, the density. Uh, yeah, you need so to when we talk the about... And there's so many things to, to cover. Yeah, ma'am. So actually, when we talk about PG uh, medical education, so there are certain things which are must know. And then there are certain things which are good to know, you know. So yeah. maybe little time we could cover only the must know topics. I know, I know, I know. Of course, no, no, I'm not at all. I, I mean, not uh, criticizing. No, no, no. I'm just, then, just I'm expressing my feelings that if at all it was somebody so close, what would you, um, what would be our approach? And that should be the approach to the patient too. That's yeah. right. But I think Dr. Gorang did a wonderful job because yeah, he yeah, was, was very thorough in everything. in his presentation and very clear in his uh, concepts, which was uh, for a second year student, it is quite. Uh, yeah, it was it was truly very well described, very well examined, yes. very well. Uh, uh, probably, the overall uh, case was very well examined. I mean, assessed. Everything was good, just perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Just perfect. Yeah. This is actually, Rushir, can we have one photograph now? Because many times, because all are here now. All faculties are in one frame. Okay. Yes. Thank you, respected examiners, for your valuable time and your well-informed and perspective point of view for this interesting case. Now, the most awaited time of the week for any obstetrician and gynecologist, the pearls of wisdom. Today's topic is ultrasound for diagnosis of ovarian masses. As we are well aware now that ultrasonography helps us to differentiate between malignancy, benign, uh, between ovarian masses, which can be benign, malignant or inconclusive. I would like uh, Dr. Sushma ma'am to invite the charismatic Dr. Sonal Panchal ma'am. Welcome, ma'am. Actually, I think I have very good words for you. Uh, you may not be there. I think you were not present. I'll just uh, mention, uh, you know, these adnexal, just uh, you were mentioning about the Doppler. So these adnexal masses may not be diagnosed. Like in what type of category they are. But we know someone somewhere, a master of masters, is well equipped with all weapons of Sri Ganesha to conquer the evils, to diagnose them categorically, as you were mentioning, with one brilliant weapon that is sonography, 
and the wisdom faculty is none other than Dr. Sonal Panjar from Namdavad. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, today's chairpersons are Dr. Alka Patankar, ma'am, and Dr. Jyoti Davle, ma'am. Dr. Alka Patankar is the head of department and professor at Indira Gandhi Government Medical College. Being her student, there are some things which I would like to tell about her. I'm very happy to introduce her as an enthusiast for patient care. She is an epitome of ideal doctor. Whoever has met ma'am or worked with ma'am will agree that whenever you are around her, you will definitely learn a new well-informed thing of the subject. Welcome ma'am. Next is Dr. Jyoti Davle ma'am. She is an assistant professor at uh, GMC Amrath Zobe. Ma'am is keen on learning and teaching. She has dealt with hundreds of high-risk uh, ANC cases as well as gynecological cases. Welcome, ma'am. Monica, we'll just uh, ask the chairperson to have a formal introduction of Dr. Sonal Panchar, ma'am. So it will be better. So you can just have that slide. Yeah. Uh, I will introduce ma'am. Dr. Sonal Panchar, ma'am, she is Master of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology, has over 20 years of experience with infertility, gynecology, high-risk obstetric scans, including 3D, 4D scans. She has given over 800 guest lectures at several conferences, and she's author of Ultrasound in Infertility and Gynecology, Text and Atlas, and various other books. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much, Dr. Sushma, for your words of introduction, too. And may I share the screen because it says you cannot start screen share. Um, Please stop sharing, beta. Yeah. Gauran, yeah. Monica. Please stop sharing your slide. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I can now. Yes. So, um, yes, it is true that. Um, Nexal masses, when they we talk about, and that too in the perimenopausal ages, we are much, much worried about malignancies. But we see adnexal masses off and on, even in the uh, reproductive age group women. And uh, that is where we probably have to think in a different way, or we need to analyze these masses in a different way. So whenever you see any adnexal lesions, the first thing we need to find out is whether it's of an ovarian origin or it's an extra ovarian origin. The second question, if it is of an ovarian origin, it is physiological or it is pathological. And then comes the question, does it look like a benign or a malignant mass? And if at all it is a malignant mass, what is the extent of the lesion? Mm -hmm. So that should be usually the thought process for these lesions. And to start with the decide the organ of origin, I think ultrasound being a, a dynamic examination is one of the best uh, tools to identify the organ of origin. And this is true, not only for the ovarian uh, masses, for any mass, if I say this mass, if I want to say this mass is not arising from this organ, that means it's an extra organic mass that is when it is the sliding organ sign which i would like to elicit where i'm seeing the lesion and i'm seeing the or uh, the the suspected over uh, organ of origin together i just push the probe in and out and if i can see the two structures moving away from each other and i can entering the 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 other other or uh, tissues in between the two or if the the two the, the lesion and the organ of origin are lying above and below uh, so they are, they are lying side by side you can actually slide them over each other this is what is called a sliding organ the sign and if this is present that means that the or the lesion is not arising from that organ and this is a very very important sign if this sign is negative, that means if you cannot slide the two or you cannot separate the two, that is when you again reassess the mass and you would want to see whether you are seeing any ovarian tissue surrounding this lesion uh, forming a ream or you are seeing any ovarian tissue forming a beak around this lesion. If the one of these two are present, that means that yes, it is of an ovarian origin. And again, it, it holds true for any other organ and the lesion too. 
So if you see a ream or a beak sign, it is definitely intra-ovarian. If you're seeing a sliding organ sign, it is definitely extra-ovarian. If both the signs are negative, that means it is extra-ovarian, but it is adherent to the ovary. So this is your, this decides the origin uh, of, of the lesion. Now coming to the third uh, 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 or the second question, which means that it is ovarian. Okay, now is it pathological or it is physiological? And we have to understand that the ovary is a house of, it is, it is a, a host of several different cystic lesions, which are majority of them are physiological in origin. There may be antral follicles, there may be dominant follicles, uh, there may be mature follicles, there may be corpus luteum, luteinized unruptured follicle. It may be a, a, a hemorrhagic cyst or a residual active corpus luteum and so on. So these are all physiological systems. Therefore, it is very essential that whenever we, uh, uh, we are talking about the lesions, the cystic lesions, especially in the ovary, that's when the first thing we need to do is to find out what phase of the cycle are we examining this patient and then correlate the, the phase of the cycle with the lesion that you're seeing. So for example, you're seeing a clear cystic lesion in the proliferative phase you first naturally think about the follicle, whereas if you're seeing a hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhage uh, a cystic lesion with hemorrhagic epigenesis inside, like fibrin strands or a fishnet pattern or a, or a honeycomb pattern, you're first going to think about a corpus luteum. So that, that is something very, very important. You have to correlate it with the physiologic. But uh, as once you have done that and you don't think that the, the lesion correlates with the physiology, that's when you start the uh, uh, more um, and further evaluation of the, of the lesion. And to, um, yes, it is true that when it comes to uh, um, next lesions, the uh, iota is, is a standard to uh, decide whether the lesions are benign or malignant. But before we do that, we must try and uh, find out if we can identify the lesion, the pathology or the, the physiological um, aberration, which has led to the development of the lesion. So I would prefer to divide these lesions into um, the ultrasound morphological classification, which is non-septated cleosis, septated cleosis, cysts with internal equals solid tumors and cysts with solid components. Now, if I'm talking about the clear septic, non septic cystic lesions, and if I'm seeing this lesion for first time in the proliferative phase, naturally, I know that this lesion has uh, the first possibility is the follicle. And to identify that it is a follicle, the first tool is the Doppler. Remember that the follicles, as soon as they attain um, their um, mature, uh, as soon as they attain their dominance, the, they start pulling blood vessels towards the cells, uh, to, towards themselves, uh, towards themselves, and it is these blood vessels which actually overlap on the follicular wall, and only then it is a perifollicular vessel. And if you see a perifollicular vessel, that means yes, it is a follicle. Follicles may grow up to a size of 25 millimeters. Until then, we still call them follicles. Beyond that, we start calling them follicular cysts. But remember, even follicular cysts is of a physiological origin, and even they show blood flows, of course, not as abundant as the follicles. Whereas if you're seeing this lesion for the first time in the secretory phase, that's when you don't think about the follicle. Uh, of course, you don't think about a, a growing follicle or a mature follicle, but it can still be a residual follicle or it can be a follicular cyst, or it can still be a simple cyst. So these are the three possible differentiations. And again, Doppler is the tool which can be very, very useful. Yes, if you have seen this patient earlier also, and you're seeing that it, it was a follicle earlier, which has kept on growing, it is still a residual follicle. And remember the follicles, which are between 11 and 14 millimeters at the time of the trigger, these are the follicles which share FSH and LS receptors. So with the trigger, these follicles are not going to rupture. They will grow further after the surge, uh, surge is over, that means after the ascending, um, and, and so when, when there is a descending trend of the LH levels, beyond that, they do not luteinize because the LH levels have gone very low, but they have grown during the ascending phase of the LH and therefore they remain as follicles, they don't luteinize. This is what is a residual follicle. 
There may be follicles and they do show some blood flows. Even the follicular cysts, they may show some blood flows, but remember simple cysts would never show any blood flow. If you have a doubt, since these are, uh, these have no solid components, they do not have a very high vascularity. Therefore, there is a very little chance they may be malignant. You can comfortably wait for two or three weeks, do a repeat scan. If it was a follicle, it's going to rupture. If it was a follicular cyst, it's going to start decreasing in size. If it was a simple cyst, it's going to remain as such. If you see such a lesion, clear non septated cystic lesion outside the ovary, the first thought should be the para ovarian cyst. But yes, of course, the differentiation can also be with the, uh, uh, the differential diagnosis can also be the, the uh, uh, hydrosalpings, but when you rotate the probe, it is the hydrosalpings which is going to elongate. We are going to see a few pictures of hydrosalpings. You may see uh, an incomplete septum in the hydrosalpings. Hydrosalpins is usually because of inflammation. If it is chronic, you may also see some adhesions and we will, we will discuss the findings in a little while. The second group is the non-septated, uh, uh, septated but clear cystic lesions. And the first possibility, if it is a stimulated cycle, you are seeing this patient in the proliferative phase, it is, of course, the multiple follicle development. And um, But if it is a non-stimulated cycle and it is a multilocated cystic lesion, I think you should think about a, a, a cystadenoma, which may be um, serous or um, mucinous, mostly benign, because as you can see here, these are the lesions which have very thin walls. Now, Doppler is a good differentiation for, for, for between the follicles and the uh, pseudocystadenomas or the cystadenomas, and also a good differentiation between a benign and a possibility of a malignancy. Uh, when it is a stimulated cycle and you see multiple cystic lesion and you put on a Doppler and you see that there is flow not only surrounding, even in the septa, this is the flow which is not in the septa, it is in the follicular walls. But if it is not a stimulated cycle and you see the flow in the septa, that's when you raise it out, it might have a small possibility of being malignant. But if it is a vascular septa completely, no solid projections, no ecogenicities in the fluid, it is most likely a benign lesion. And we would put it into the ORADS to uh, one or two. Uh, yeah, we would put it into the ORADS one, a maximum two uh, most of the times. If you see a septic cystic lesion outside the ovary, then the commonest, I'm only talking about the commonest lesions, there are multiple other causes, but the commonest lesion, uh, re reason is the peritoneal inclusions, as we know it's a result of uh, some inflammation at some time. And um, typically, these are irregular in shape. On probe pressure, you can press them. You may see septa inside, but they move with respiration and with uh, pulsations because the fluid inside is not under tension. Uh, you may see ovary very close to uh, this uh, uh, lesions. You may also see some parietal papillae inside, and there's all and there are no solid projections inside. These all tell you yes, it is probably, uh, and you do not see any floating bowel looks inside. This tells you it is a loculated fluid, and that means it is most likely a peritoneal inclusion. Of course, there are other differential diagnoses also, but not as common as the peritoneal inclusions. But instead of that, you are seeing an irregular fluid collection with floating bowel loops. Even if you can see septa inside, because of floating bowel loops, this is a free fluid. Remember, the septa usually are not truly septa. There may be pre-existing allergens, and because of the fluid collection, there's separation of the organs, which leads to this uh, uh, illusion of, of a septum in this fluid collection. But these are, uh, so that is a uh, floating bowel loops is, is a very important sign which differentiates between the loculated fluid and the free fluid in the pulps. Coming to the third category, and that is uh, cystic lesions with internal ecogenicities. Now, when I say internal ecogenicities, it is very important. So, so uh, that is why I mean, it, it's very important to use specific terms. When we say internal ecogenicities, we're not meaning solid projections. So when I say internal ecogenicities, clearly mean that is ecogenicity in the contents. That is not a solid projection. They're not papillary projections. And uh, these are... Um, uh, uh, these are the lesions which may have uh, uh, thick walls or um, maybe even sometimes thin walls. The walls may sometimes be irregular, in, uh, 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 so they may not be smooth. They may have irregularities. Uh, 
still they are not papillary projections. And this is something very important. Most of the ecogenesis is when we are talking the lesions in this group, they are hemorrhagic in, in uh, uh, quality. That means they may be fibrin strands and fishnet pattern, etc. So if you're seeing lesions which are thick walls with hemorrhagic ecogenesis inside, the possibilities are if you're seeing this lesion for the first time, the secretory phase definitely, definitely first thing of a corpus luteum. And as you put on a Doppler, a corpus luteum, which is adequate, uh, which has an adequate function, which is not uh, a corpus luteum, a failed corpus luteum or an inadequate corpus luteum, will show a beautiful ring of color. And if you put on a Doppler, it will show a very low resistance flow where the RI resistance index is less than 0.5. But if you see such a lesion and you see that the flows are inadequate, there are flows, but they are inadequate, or there's a high resistance flow with R is more than 0.5, this may be either an inadequate, this may be an inadequate corpus luteum and may result into a luteal phase defect. Instead, if I'm seeing this lesion for the first time in the proliferative phase, naturally it cannot be a corpus luteum. And that is when I would suspect it being a regressing corpus luteum or it can be a, a, a hemorrhagic cyst. Now, when I say hemorrhagic cyst, I mean a corpus luteum, which has stopped functioning, but has not resolved anatomically. Since it has stopped functioning, it's not going to show any vascularity surrounding. So in a proliferative phase, I can have such a cystic lesion, which has hemorrhagic equivalence. So there is no flow at all, which is a hemorrhagic cyst. But if it has still has some flow surrounding, which means it is a regressing corpus luteum of the previous cycle. Instead, if I'm seeing such a lesion in the secretory phase, which has no flow, it is a residual hemorrhage exist of the previous cycle, but there's a rare possibility. Sometimes it may also be an endometrium on because whether I'm talking about an endometrium or I'm talking about the corpus luteum or I'm talking about the hemorrhagic cyst, they all basically have hemorrhagic contents in the cystic lesion. And this, therefore, the 2D uh, appearances are very, very same. If I say so, why am I not talking about LUF? Because when I'm talking about LUF, the luteinized endometrial follicle, it's very important to remember here that the name itself says it, it is unruptured. Even if it is unruptured, there can be no no hemorrhage inside. So luteinized and ruptured follicle does show thick ecogenic walls, hyperechoic walls, has low level ecogenesis, but no hemorrhagic ecogenesis as a rule. And if you put on a Doppler, usually the resistance indices are between 0.5 and 0.6. If I'm talking, therefore, about the cystic lesions with internal ecogenesis, which are hemorrhagic, uh, and, and the commonest cause is, is uh, corpus luteum. Corpus luteum can appear any of these. So it can have any of these appearances. It can also have any of these appearances. I repeat here that it is the function. It is a hormonal secretion, which tells me it is a corpus luteum or it is a a hemorrhage exists. That means a structure which is just anatomically there, hormonally, it is not, not active. If we therefore are talking about lesions which have internal ecogenesis, which are hemorrhagic, endometrioma is, is the most closest simile. And of course, as I told you, it may have similar pictures like corpus luteum, but more commonly, we all know that even we talk about alta and the, the simple uh, descriptors, Corp, uh, hemorrhage exist, uh, sorry, endometrioma is diagnosed by the ground glass appearance, but it is not just the ground glass appearance, which is important. And there's another point, which also I want to bring to your notice, and that is ground glass appearances in the pre-menopausal women may be a sign of endometrioma, but in the post-menopausal women, they may be a strong sign of malignancy. So Crown glass appearance, yes, it is true that it is one of the signs which tells me it is endometrium, but not always. Uh, what else would I see? Because there's thick fluid inside. I would also see what is described as uh, uh, acoustic streaming. You can see here tiny particles, tiny fine particles trying to settle down based on the gravity, which is, which is called an acoustic streaming sign because of the thick fluid. The third thing you are finding is layering effect you're finding three different layers, and, and even if not three different layers, many times you would find a vertical fluid level. This is not truly vertical in the longitudinal section. This is anterior, and then that is posterior. So it's an anechoic fluid anteriorly, which is serum, and uh, ecogenic fluid posteriorly, which may be whole blood or maybe solid products of the blood. 
And so that is the third sign which you can see crown glass appearance. You may see hemorrhagic echogenesis, a caustic streaming sign. You may see a vertical fluid level. Moreover, very importantly, you will see hyper echoic flex in the walls, as you have been seeing here. You seeing here. And this is a very important sign, which tells me it is most likely a endometrioma because it is this big, it, this is thought to be because of hemosiderin and cholesterol deposit. And <clears throat> it is almost specific of um, uh, endometriomas. These are not seen in corpus luteum. More work, endometriomas, typically dynamic examination is very, very important. They are painful on pro pressure and more common to have adhesions in presence of endometriomas. When you put on a Doppler, typically endometriomas, they show short course vessels. What do we mean by short course vessels? The vessels, they come and approach the wall of the endometrioma, but unlike the corpus lutea, these vessels, they do not run along the margins of the lesion. And <clears throat> this is because these vessels have branches at acute angles, therefore only a short uh, segment of uh, uh, any particular vessel would be seen in any one 2D image. This is what is described as short course vessels of endometriomas. When these vessels are seen on the 3D power doppler, it will give you a typical bird's nest appearance. So these are the signs of endometriomas. Generally, endometriomas do not show a uh, uh, solid projections or papillary projections, but if the patient with endometrioma gets a pregnancy, there may be a decidualization of the internal uh, margin of the endometrioma, and this may definitely lead to solid projections, and they may also lead to show vascularity, and this raises strongly a doubt of malignancy. So that is something very important to be kept in mind. Uh, coming to the second, uh, more uh, so so we have discussed uh, the third group of lesions. The fourth group of lesions, of course, I would want to discuss is the fibromas. But fibromas, I'm going to discuss a little later. I would first discuss the lesions which have solid and cystic components. And of course, we are talking more about benign. We are talking more about the more commonly seen lesions rather than rare lesions. And if I'm talking about that, the first comes here as the dermoids. We know dermoids are very, very common. They may have solid and cystic components. We all know that it is a purely 2D diagnosis. Uh, and the typical signs that you would see is low level internal ecogenesis. There may be hyperechoic uh, lines. There may be hyperechoic dots, all because of hair. There may be tooth like projections, which posterior shadowing. Um, there may be, uh, again, uh, hyperechoic balls. There may be hyperechoic blades with posterior shadowing. There may be hair balls, ecogenic uh, round areas. Very typically, you also again have a, a vertical fluid level in dermoids also. But if you if if you have observed it rightly here, the hyperechoic layer is seen anteriorly, and the anechoic or the hypoechoic layer is seen posteriorly here. Echogenic layer is the sebaceous material. Fat is hyperechoic, is seen floating over the fluid. So you get a fluid vertical fluid level, but totally opposite as that of the endometrium. Moreover, sometimes you may also see snowballs, and sometimes this is also described as a tip of the iceberg sign. Why? Because you can see the anterior margin of the ball-like structure. The posterior margins are not identified, but this is hyperechoic because of fat, and fat is a poor transmitter to sound, therefore you're not seeing the posterior margins. This uh, very closely mimics the bowel uh, gas, but you're seeing here typically the ream and the beak sign of the ovary, which tells me it is introvarian, and therefore the dermoid. Dermoids typically are avascular. Um, after that, uh, if we go to, uh, so so that is that is the commonest lesions. Of course, we are also going to talk about the epithelial tumors. But uh, um, uh, before before I go there, uh, uh, if you remember, we talked initially about the physiological lesions, and we also talked about the pathological lesions amongst the pathological list. After talking about the other lesions, we had talked about uh, there, there was a list uh, which said hydrosalpins and inflammatory lesions. So. Let's go, uh, go through that. And again, this is one of the very common and, and very important uh, diagnosis to be made. Free fluid, floating bowel loops, floating femoral and is what you're seeing here. And you're typically seeing the thickened uh, tube here with the swollen fimbria, which tells you it is acute salpingitis. In cases of acute salpingitis, if you put on a Doppler, yes, it is in acute salpingitis that ascites is very common and therefore you can pick up the thickened tubes 
And even the swollen fimbria, if you put on a Doppler, it, they usually appear hypervascular and they also show a low resistance vascularity, even if the hydrosalpin suffers later on. As a consequence of, of the acute salpingitis, you would still be able to identify thick walls and vascularity in it. These are all the signs which tell you it is acute inflammation. Acute inflammation may also show typical thickened mucosal uh, 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 rugus pattern. And uh, again, uh, it is uh, this also which tells you it is acute inflammation and hydrosalpings. It is this thickened mucosal folds, which may on the transverse section be seen typically as the Cogwell sign. So these are all the signs which tell me it is an acute inflammation and hydrosalpings, but whenever it is a chronic inflammation, there's fibrosis because of that, the walls of the hydrosalpinges, uh, they become uh, the more smoother. And that is when they also become slightly hyperechoic. When they become hyper, uh, when they become hyperechoic and they become slightly rigid, that's when you can actually not uh, ident. Uh, I mean, you you will not see a gross distension of the tube. You would actually see a thinner lumen, but uh, there would be a persistent fluid. There may be adhesions. It may also be lead to uh, tubo ovarian masses, and these are the cases of uh, chronic uh, hydrosalpins. Uh, you may be thinking I have omitted a few slides in between, which are uh, uh, a bit of a repetition, but still, if you have uh, uh, acute hydrosalpings many times, you may have uh, thick tortuous tubes. It may appear as multiple cystic lesions, and it would only be a 3D, uh, which would be help you um, establish the continuity between uh, the, the different cystic lesions and uh, confirm the diagnosis of hydrosalpings. You can also see it on the inversion mode, which would show, show you the mucosal folds also. So that is about the hydrosalpings. Uh, this fluid it may also be an inflammatory fluid, or it may be because of, that means in presence of pelvic abscess, or it may be because of hematoma also. So if you see that there's free fluid, which is which has low level ecogenesis, which has uh, fibrine strands or uh, thin uh, adhesion bands inside, also think of uh, hematomas and uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, Mm, uh, but it is the clinical history, uh, the relevance to that is very important. When I'm talking about that, tuberculosis is one of the very common uh, 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 diagnosis thought of, not, not specific signs in uh, on ultrasound for tuberculosis, but there are some signs which are much more common. One, that you may see low-level ecogenesis with a typical lettuce pattern. You may see septated ascites, that means fluid collection with septa inside with nodules there. You may also see a low-level ecogenesis, fluid in, with low-level ecogenesis and floating cysts inside. Moreover, you may also see that the ovary may show hyper ecogenesis, which is described as ovarian calcinosis. There's no posterior shadowing. It's only hyper ecogenesis that you're seeing. You may also see small follicles with a complete hyper echoic ring, similar to what you would also see in the torsion. But very importantly here, these ovaries, um, they, they typically show um, um, a very scanty vascularity. And unlike torsion, there are no acute signs. So uh, you would see that is what, what is described as a ream sign of the follicles and ovarian calcinosis. Moreover, very importantly, an ovary which otherwise appears very, very normal, but does not show, um, uh, uh, but does but, but shows uh, unexplained decreased vascularity is one of the signs of uh, tuberculosis. Coming to malignancies, this has been described. I'm not going to describe it in detail, but just I want to bring uh, to your notice two important things. A uh, very important paper by Professor Lille Valentine, and that says a very, very clear and a very, a very, a very crisp idea about what can be a malignancy, any lesion which appears, which shows heterogeneous ecogenicity, which shows irregular margins are possibly on 2D ultrasound are possibly malignant. Whereas Professor Kuriak from Zagreb group, uh, they, they also give a very important sign and that is whenever the resistance index in the blood vessels which are supplying the, the lesion, a complex lesion shows vascular uh, RA of less than 0.41, this is an early sign of malignancy. So you can diagnose malignancies early, but remember that low resistance is a sign of malignancy, but it is also a sign of acute inflammation. It is also a physiological sign of a mature follicle and a good corpus system. So always beware before you just use Dopplers and moreover, 
And it's also important to remember that, uh, yes, low resistance is a sign, maybe a sign of malignancy, but high resistance does not exclude malignancy because when we say that malignancy appears, um, uh, when we say that the uh, malignancies are more common in postmenopausal age group, and we say that the low resistance blood flow is because of the new angiogenesis, when the new, gen new angiogenesis occurs, the blood, res the blood flow resistance is lower than the normal. And in the postmenopausal ovaries, it is very, very high resistance. Otherwise, so even if the resistance falls because of new angiogenesis, it may many a times not reach even 0.5, but still it is a malignancy one. Number two is, in any lesion, there may be, in, in any, any ovary that has a malignancy, there may be pre-existing vessels also, which still care if we have a normal resistance blood flow. It's only the newly blood flow, uh, newly formed vessels which have a lower resistance blood flow. So that is also to be kept in mind. Moreover, you also know that these blood vessels, they... Um, because of the new angiogenesis, they do not have muscularis, and therefore there may be microaneurysms um, in between. And in between uh, the microaneurysms, the lumen may be normal. So, in the uh, if if you measure the blood flow in the microaneurysms, it's going to be low resistance, but in the thinner parts, it may be a normal resistance. So remember that low resistance may indicate malignancy, but high resistance does not exclude malignancy. What is more important than the actual branching pattern and and the individual vessel assessment that you can do on the three D ultrasound one uh, is um, heterogeneous vascular density. That means in some areas increased vascularity in some areas, decreased vascularity is the one thing which gives you, where which tells you it is malignancy. The second important thing is individual vessel. It shows variable caliber. There may be dilatations, there may be narrowing. That also tells you it is malignancy. The third important thing, of course, microaneurysms and the vascular legs. The fourth important sign is what we call a dichotomous branching pattern. That means the branches and the original vessel, the parent vessels are equal in diameter. Uh, and these are all this. And moreover, the malignant vessels, um, if, if you look at the normal branching tree, uh, uh, vascular tree in, in the body, uh, they carry, the main vessel carries the branches with itself, whereas in the malignancy, it leaves behind the branches. So you find branches at obtuse angles. And these are the signs which tell you it is possibly uh, malignancy. Yes, it is true that there are many signs which would tell us that there's a possibility of malignancy, but many times there's still a confusion. It's a benign or a malignant patient. And therefore, ALTA came in, into, uh, uh, be, it became very, very popular. These guidelines were established by the ESOC people. And um, it basically is important to, to learn and to um, uh, follow ALTA is because, yes, true that it can differentiate between benign and malignant, but that can be done by experts even without using ALTA. What is it more important is to standardize the way we describe the lesions. And this is something very, very important. The first important thing is we, uh, we are going to talk about is whether the lesion is uni uh, it, it has a septum or not. So the, the structures or the, the description or the description terminologies that we are going to standardize are septum, solid projections. What do we mean by this? Cystic contents, uh, we have to define the anechoic low level ground glass hemorrhagic or mixed ecogenesis, wall irregularities, shadow societies and whether the lesion is unilocular, multilocular, solid, or cystic lesion. Of course, there is not enough time. I was told I have to finish at 8.30. Uh, there's not enough time to discuss the entire aorta. But if I quickly tell you, uh, a septum, we all probably know what is a septum, that it is a thin strand which extends from one wall to the other wall. If it doesn't extend from one wall to the other wall, that's when we say it is an incomplete septum, but incomplete septum can be incomplete only in one of the planes. It can be otherwise a, a complete septum. Dr. Sushma, just tell me when to stop. Uh, the second the second is um, the thickness of the septum, irregular, irregular, and what is the thickest part of the septum? What is the thickness of the thickest part? When we say solid component, it exhibits high ecogenicity, suggesting the presence of the uh, uh, soft tissues, uh, which may be myometrium, it may mimic ovarian stroma, it may be like a fibroid. Irregular thick wall, regular septa or normal ovarian tissue is also considered as solid tissues or solid components in the tumor. And though in case of doubt, even if you have, that means if you have a solid 
if you have an ecogenic shadow in the cystic lesion and you're not sure whether it's a blood clot or it's a solid component, you have to take it the worst. So that means you always have to think it's a solid component and it's not a blood. How do you differentiate a solid component from the debris or a blood clot? Remember, a solid component, it is adherent to the wall and therefore sliding organ sign will not move it in relation to the cystic wall. Second, solid projections are more, though they may have a plaque-like growth, but more commonly, it may be, uh, if it is a if it is solid projection like a cauliflower, it's usually the convex, uh, um, the surface is convex uh, inside the, the, the lumen of the cystic lesion. If it is plaque-like, it may be difficult to differentiate between a uh, 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 thickening of uh, between uh, uh, debris and the uh, uh, solid projection. But as I told you, it is the sliding organ sign, which is very, very useful to differentiate between a solid projection and the debris. Uh, coming to uh, the fibrin strands now, whether it is a septum or a fibrin strand is something very important to differentiate between. And remember that whenever you see septum-like uh, ecogenicities, when you rotate the probe to see the same ecogenicity or the strand, if you see concavity at any point of your rotation, as you are seeing here, you are seeing a concavity here, which means it is a fibrin strand, it is not a septum. So we know what, uh, what is a septum, we know what is a complete and an incomplete septum, we know what is a solid projection, how to differentiate a solid projection from debris, how to differentiate a fibrin strand from a septum. Coming to the papillary projections, the solid projections which arise from the cystic wall are more than three millimeters in height. If they're lesser than that, they're just irregularities, more than three millimeter in height are or papillary projections. You must count the number of papillary projections. You must give the dimensions of the papillary projections. If the lesion, if the solid components are larger than one centimeter, uh, larger than seven millimeters, that's when you say they're solid components and then you don't call them papillary projections anymore. So using correct terms are very, very important. Whenever you're talking about papillary projections or, sol uh, or, or solid projections, the number, the size of which are very important to be mentioned. And if they're multiple, at least the size of the larger ones and where they are. Uh, what is the ecogenicity of this solid projections? What are the margins? Like they're smooth uh, or they're irregular are all important to be mentioned. mentioned. Uh, then come, uh, moreover, it's also important to do a Doppler and find out their vascular or avascular. As I've already told you, you mentioned the surface and the ecogenicity of the same. Uh, you should also mention what are the contents of the lesion, uh, whether they are anechoid, they are crown glass, they are low, sorry, they are uh, anechoid, they are low level, they are crown glass, they are ecogenic or they are, there is a heterogeneous uh, uh, or there is a, a fluid with different densities there. Coming to the uh, cystic lesions, uh, which are called mixed cystic lesions, they may be mixed. They, they, this, this mix is usually of either two fluids, or it is fat and fluid, or it is an abscess, and according, or they may be solid components, and that is what you need to mention. <clears throat> What is in detail? What is the mix, and how much is the percentage of the ecogenic or the non-ecogenic uh, component? Coming to the acoustic shadowing, acoustic shadowing is the posterior shadowing that you get whenever you have severely hyperechoic or dense structures in the path of the sound beam. It hits up, it eats up all the energy, sound beam energy, and therefore posterior to that, you will not see any ecogenesis, and that is what is called acoustic shadowing. Acoustic shadowing is something very, very important to be mentioned, and the next one is the situs. So that means you have talked about septum, solid components, internal contents, you have talked about fibrin, you have talked about debris, the papillary projections. Mm, um, surface of the papillary projections, it, uh, ecogenicity of the solid projections and the contents of the cystic lesion. Coming to uh, an acoustic shadowing and ascites, now coming to what do we mean by unilocular, multilocular? <clears throat> Remember any lesion that has that is uh, that is just just a single cystic lesion. There are no locules inside. Is a unilocular cystic lesion, but should have no solid component. When this lesion has some solid component, it is called unilocular solid. When it is multilocular but has no solid component, it is multilocular. When it is multilocular along with solid components, as you can see here, it is multilocular solid. 
and then there can be solid lesions. So uh, when, when the contents of the cystic lesion, more than 80% of it is solid, that's when you call it a, 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 solid a solid lesion. So that is how you, these are the descriptive terms that are to be used so that you can easily uh, um, describe any lesion uniformly, unanimously, universally, the same terms are used and you do not confuse the lesions and it would be easier for you to differentiate them between benign and malignants. Why would it be easier for you to differentiate between benign and malignants is because it is this system, IOTA, which gives you very important five criteria, which tells you it is, uh, it, it is benign or malignant. And I would directly go to that first and coming back to this lesion, specific lesions afterwards, um, you would know that if there is a unilocular cyst, if there is a solid component, which is the largest diameter of which is less than seven millimeters, if it is has a caustic shadowing, if it has, <clears throat> if it is multilocular instead of unilocular, but the tumor largest, uh, but it is absolutely smooth with the largest diameter of less than 10 centimeters, and there's no blood flow on Doppler, this is a benign tumor. Uh, any of one or more of these uh, features tells you it is a benign tumor. Any one of more of more of these features tells you it is a malignant lesion, irregular solid tumor, presence of ascites, at least four papillary structures, irregular multilocular solid lesion larger than 10 centimeters, and very strong blood flow. If you have one benign lesion but no malignant, it is a benign lesion. If you have one malignant or more, more one more than one malignant, but no benign, then it is malignant. But if there is a combination of two, that's when you need to use other methods, which is called logistic regression, et cetera. I know I, to, I cannot complete, complete uh, uh, I cannot finish completely in this uh, short time, but yes, it is a very important tool to deal with these lesions. It also describes certain simple descriptors, endometriomas, as you know, it has, we, we have already described, I'm not going to discuss it again, dermoids we have described, simple cysts we have described, Benign cystic adenomas, remember most, you, it is usually unilocular, but can be multilocular, thin walls, thin septa, no papillary projections, clear cystic <laughs> contents. Cystic adenofibroma is, is a very typical lesion where you have a large cystic lesion, no internal leukogenesis, but a solid projections and a posterior shadowing, uh, the solid, solid projection is much smaller compared to the complete uh, uh, size of the cyst. Borderline tumors are important to diagnose, and they, they may be serous or mucinous. They may be multilocular. You have solid projections, but these solid projections do not have posterior shadowing. Honeycomb appearance is often very common. <clears throat> mucinous tumors, especially when borderline, they have solid projections with tiny anechoic areas, which is described as honeycomb appearance. Let us not go into details of every tumor. Yes, we do have that but I have already crossed, uh, overshooted by 10 minutes. I don't want to talk about uh, those solutions more um, uh, in detail, uh, but because even if we diagnose them, uh, we have to still do a histopathological diagnosis. Fibroma is one important uh, uh, lesion, which is a solid lesion in the ovary, isoechoic to the stroma, difficult to diagnose. Whenever you find excessive stroma, it's when, and it is isoechoic, it's not hyperechoic. Always put on a Doppler. If you see a nice ring of color, just like a fibroid, it is a fibroma. Fibromas, when large, they may undergo degeneration. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they may also, uh, when very large, may lead to mixed syndrome. York sac tumors also have a very typical uh, feature, which are multiseptated, and they have typical hyperechoic rounded small lesions. So that is that is what I can cover in that short time of uh, half an hour about the, the ovarian lesions. But I want to bring to your notice that whenever you see an adnexal mass, yes, you should first try to diagnose yourself, fit it into physiology, talk about, <clears throat> think about common lesions first. If you cannot go to the IOTA guidelines, simple rules, if that helps you, fine. If not, go to the logic regression. But remember, above all is the expert opinion. So always try to analyze the lesions more in detail on 2D for its morphology on Doppler, for its vascular pattern, for its resistance, for the uh, branching patterns. 
do a 3D if you need to do a dynamic examination and that can lead to diagnosis, at least would very surely be, uh, help you to differentiate between benign and malignant lesions clearly. Thank you very much and thank you for that extra time. Thank you very much, That's Madam. Really for, uh, yeah, yes. for such a, you have really mm -hmm. done justice to this topic. In short, I will describe that you have presented the students with butter. You have churned the curd and presented the butter. If the students get a question on the role of ultrasound in adnexal masses, I, I am very sure that they will come out with flying colors and they will pass with honors in that question at least. You have really done a justice to the Thank topic. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I would uh, also like to extend a small service to the students. If at all you have any queries, don't hesitate to send me um, a WhatsApp. I'll definitely answer them. Thank Extend you. it to pictures Actually, as well, madam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And really, you are a really born teacher. What Thank do you say you. in Marathi? Yeah. Made, had a, had a teacher. <laughs> Thank it's you. really wonderful. Thank you very much. And I think we must have a separate session with different categories. That will be better. Sure. That, will be, that will be better for our PG students. Sure. We'll take your convenient time pleasure. and accordingly we'll divide and we'll have a good symposium on that. My so pleasure, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. As every good thing comes to an end, so does this session now. So I'd like to invite uh, the most dynamic Dr. Bhakti Gurjar, ma'am, uh, to say the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Monica. Um, so, uh, because our uh, dear uh, secretary, Madam Dr. Uh, Pragati Kharkar is not there, so I'm proposing vote of thanks today. So, let me begin by thanking Dr. Uh, Sushma Deshmukh and Dr. Pragati Kharkar for initiating and supporting this program uh, with noble and pure purpose of uh, training of all postgraduate students. Uh, I, let me thank our student, uh, Dr. Gaurang, who has really done a good job uh, today. And he was ably guided by... Uh, teachers, senior teachers, Dr. Smriti Agrawal and Dr. Ashish Zararia. I thank them for sparing their time. Um, the icing on the cake for today's session was really uh, the lecture by Dr. Sonal Panchal. I thank her from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I think anyone who has listened to the lecture today is going to be very clear uh, about what he, he or she is looking at when he's looking at an adnexal mass on ultrasound. Uh, I also thank Dr. Alka Patankar, Madam, our HOD, and Dr. Jyoti Daule uh, for kindly consenting to be chairpersons for today's session. Uh, I must thank Dr. Anuja Bhalerao and Dr. Uh, Prachi Dikshit, who are co-conveners -co with me for this session. And last but not the least, I must thank uh, the audience, that is our students, for whom uh, this the, the whole program is being run. Uh, and lastly, also, I thank my dear student, Monica Jain, for the very smooth conduct of this program. So thank you once again. And the Corona thank Remedies you. for providing the platform. Of course, we, we yeah. cannot do <laughs> Thank Monica you, Corona. conducted very nicely. Huh? All did very well. So I think it was a very nice program. I have all PG students must have been benefited with this wonderful program. We would have liked to take a question answer session also, but for the want of time, I think we would not yes. be able to. I uh, but as Madam has graciously uh, accepted to take queries on WhatsApp also, so we can take benefit of that also. Yeah, we can have a separate session also some other time with all the this thing. So we can have different uh, criteria and all this because it's a very uh, difficult to cover all the things in a short period, I think. Yes. Okay. Then. So thank you, everyone. It was a very nice uh, discussion followed by a great lecture. Thank you for being a part of the program. Thank you. And good night. Goodbye. Okay.